looking at a good friend of mine, Nancy Dickerson, who has worked extensively in the area of crisis intervention in schools with various school personnel, including bus drivers, teachers, and administrators. And Nancy is going to be presenting a model that she'll tell us about of children's needs. Nancy Dickerson. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure um, helping out a chance to talk about something that I really love. Um, I've worked in uh, centers for uh, children with emotional disturbance for about 15 years, and over time, uh, working with children in crisis, I developed a model that um, looks a little bit like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, but it is um, what I'm calling the basic needs of children. And uh, we're going to go through this and just kind of identify these needs and talk about how they get met or don't get met by the schools. And I use this model for training staff so that they have just a framework for understanding children who are misbehaving or children who are really looking like they are in trouble. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, what this is is a hierarchy, kind of like the food pyramid, where you start at the bottom and work up. And um, what we're working up towards is to have a successful child. And so we'll put success up here because that's what we're aiming for. This framework is really helpful because I think what it shows is that kids have certain needs that really need to be in place before they can move up to the next step. Uh, most people have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and he generally starts with basic biological needs. I work a lot with animals, um, I, horses and, and cats and dogs and and what I find is that uh, children have a lot of the same kinds of instinctual needs. And when, when I um, started to do this, I, I thought about biological needs down here and realized that the first thing that needs to be in place for children is actually safety. And to illustrate this, I use the example of animals who are out in the field grazing and um, I often use the, the movie Bambi where all the, the deer are out there with their heads down and they're grazing in the sun and suddenly they realize there's a predator. And what happens is the heads go up, the ears go up, and there's a moment of flight or fight. And most animals will flee if they can. And it's the same thing with children. Um, I work a lot with children who tend to run away from things that they're afraid of or immediately get into a fighting stance. So there's that flight or fight response for children um, if they don't feel safe. So safety can take a number of forms for kids. Um, it's going to be small down here. But there's the physical safety, which needs to come first, obviously. If children don't feel safe, they are not going to be able to settle down and learn in a classroom. Uh, and this physical safety can be um, compromised certainly at home, but also occasionally in schools. Uh, there's also emotional safety. And uh, often children do not feel emotionally safe around their peers, sometimes around teachers, and a lot of times around the adults that they live with. Okay, so these are the things that I check out when I see a child in crisis. The third thing that I'm going to put in here in terms of safety, because people ask, what about parents, is that I think that there's a need for supervision, which guarantees, or is supposed to guarantee, children's safety. And a lot of times, I see in schools that the supervision is lacking. Uh, I can remember a kid I counseled a long time ago, I'll try not to get into too many stories, but I counseled a child who was having a real tough time because every time he went into the locker room, he was beat up by the, by the rest of the boys. And it was a boy thing around fifth or sixth grade, and I went and approached the teacher of the gym class, and he said, I can't supervise the locker room. Well, and the problem continued and probably continues to this day, that these are places that have less than, less than adequate supervision. Buses, um, transition times, playground, cafeteria, those kinds of things. Okay, so these are the places where safety may be compromised for kids in schools. The next step would be biological needs. And that includes the basic food, water, shelter, 
But it also includes things like sleep. And I put sleep down as a basic biological need. I, we often see kids whose sleep is compromised. If a child comes in and he's sleeping in the morning, a young child, not a high schooler, but, but younger children, if they're sleeping in school, their safety is being compromised. They're not able to sleep. They're either not having the supervision and safety to get sleep or something else is going on that's keeping them up and worried. <coughs> so I often check on what their sleep needs are. And it creates some problems in school, obviously, for children who need to sleep. And the question is, we can, can we let them sleep in school? It comes up quite a bit. Uh, and my answer is if a child needs sleep, it's a basic biological need. We may need to give them a 20 minute nap for them to go on in their day. Other than, otherwise, there's a crisis anyway. <coughs> um, another one is medications. I'll just put down medical care. Because certain, certain times, medical, medical concerns get in the way. We have children who come in and they are sick and they're not being taken care of or taken to a doctor, toothaches, those kinds of things that I need to check out occasionally. And there are children who are on medications that need to take them, haven't taken them, are out of them at home, those kinds of things that I check out with kids. After biological needs, um, I put something in its own category, although I believe it is a basic biological need. And that is touch. I'll put it down here as caring touch, because certainly there are touches that can be harmful to children. But children need caring touch, and I see this all the time at work. My work is very physical with children. I am always letting them know that I'm there for them. It grounds them physically. I have a little rule because it makes people crazy in the schools when they talk about touching children. I say armpits up. Everything else is fair game, everything above the armpits. So I'll touch a child on the arm or on the back of the shoulders and rub their head if they let me. And generally, they really respond well to this caring touch. When you think about children and touch as a basic need, you think about failure to thrive and the research that was done on premature babies who did not get touched and were put in incubators. And they were given all of their basic biological needs but not touch. And we discovered that children would often die from lack of exposure to human warmth. So I make sure that I provide this for children who have not had enough of it. Um, the next, oh, and, and I also wanted to put in here, I think that another thing that is a basic biological need is exercise and movement. I've seen a lot of kids who do not are not allowed to move around or don't have the um, access to places to exercise. And it tends to be a problem for them when they get into a classroom and are asked to sit because they're fidgety and need to work off energy. And also, proper exercise and development for children if they're allowed to explore their world and use equipment and move around and, and get out and, and walk, crawl, walk, run, skip, hop, all those things that are developmentally appropriate tend to do better when they actually sit down and try to learn fine motor movement, reading skills, math skills, etc. So uh, sometimes this gets overlooked in curriculum, you know, that children need some, some time to move and stretch. We are seeing that people are putting yoga exercises into their classrooms to help children learn to, um, you know, use short, small space in short time but get a little bit of movement in. Okay. These three things are the base for children to develop physically.